Let me say welcome to Church 307, to the guys over at the prison and our friends at the jail, those of you who are here in the room. Today I want to consider a question together. How does God protect us? Like, if I put my faith in God, how should I expect in my life to be protected? Let me ask you this. Are you afraid to die? Don't raise your hand. But are you afraid to die? Recently, I've been asking some people this question, and I, I get like a 50-50 response. Like, half of the people say, yeah, I'm afraid to die. Everybody's afraid to die. Nobody wants to die. The other half of the people, I feel like they, they feel some social pressure or uh, maybe because I'm a pastor or something, they feel like they need to say, no, I'm not afraid to die. I'm, I got, I'm good. Well, here's the honest truth. I think, this is just my thought, I think everybody is afraid to die. Like, scripture tells us that we should love others as much as we love ourselves. In other words, the insinuation is you love yourself, right? You don't, you don't really want to die. I go to this torture chamber every single morning called the gym, and I run on a treadmill next to a bunch of other people that smell terrible and look terrible and are torturing themselves. Why? Well, we'd like to extend our lives a little bit, the doctor says, I need to lose a little bit of weight if I want to not die. Or maybe at least I want to make my life in this world a little bit better. So yeah, I'll go torture myself in the mornings a little bit. I'll, I, I'll do that. If you have any kind of fear, if you're afraid of heights, if you're afraid of snakes or spiders, statistically, a large percent of you are afraid of one of those things. Why? You, you don't want to die. If, if you got a fear, it's probably because you don't want to die. Yes, we're all, in, on some level, a little bit afraid to die. Well, here's the reality. It's going to happen. It's coming. Like, nobody's going to escape this deal. Every one of us are going to die. At least our bodies are. Right? Have you ever known somebody that just seemed unshakable? It's like, even when they are afraid, they're not afraid. Even when they are in danger, they look like they're not in danger. Even when things are going bad, somehow they just stay strong, they stay steady, they stay faithful, and they stay focused. You ever known anybody like that? I have. I've known a few people like that in my life, and I feel like when I look at their lives, I see each one of them had a common understanding. Or maybe they each had a common belief. They believed that God doesn't always protect us physically, but when we put him first, he gives us peace and eternal protection. So I'd like to unpack this statement today. And what does that mean for us? For God to give us peace that goes beyond understanding. And for God to give us eternal protection. I know that seems like a really simple idea, but the version of Christianity that I hear preached so often today is entirely dominated with a physical focus. It's all about this world. It's all about making my life in this world better. That's the focus of much American Christianity. It's all about making my human life better. But our faith is so much bigger than just making your human life better. Our faith is so much bigger than that. Jesus said, I have told you this, told you all of this, so that you may have peace and me. So right before he says this, he lays out the gospel message. If you hide your treasure in heaven, you st store your treasure in heaven, he talks about in this passage. He talks about putting your faith in him. He lays out the gospel message. And he says, if you understand that you are more than just a physical being, then you will have peace in him. I think that is the mark of someone who knows that their life is in Christ, not in the world. 
My hope is not in this world. My identity is not in this world, so my peace does not come from this world. My faith in God is so great that the worries of this world can fade away. They become less important. Do I still have fears? Yes. Do I still have temptations? Yes. Do I still feel anger? Yes. But the more and more I put my faith in an eternal God, the less and less I worry about this world. And it gives me peace. Jesus says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. You're going to have pain. Your bodies, in this life, you're going to feel pain. It's going to happen. Even in victory, we will have pain. I think the temptation is to believe that if God has given us victory, then that means everything's going to be easy. No, because the victory is more than just a physical victory. Anybody who's ever achieved a victory before has recognized that it required some pain to get to the place where you could win that victory. Anybody who's ever won a race or gotten a raise or a promotion recognized that it took some work and there was some pain involved in that process. And as we walk toward becoming the people that God created us to be, and if we walk toward our eternal destination, yes, we're going to experience the pain on the way to the victory. And God never intended our lives to be easy. God never intended for our human lives to be comfortable. That was not his goal for us. So so what does he say? In this world, you're going to have trials and sorrows. But take heart. Why? Because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. In other words, I'm bigger than all of it. I'm above this. All this stuff, that this, these distractions and these pains and these frustrations that you're experiencing, I'm bigger than it. I'm above it all. So when you put your faith in him, when you give him control, when you put him first, he can do what you cannot. If I offered you a billion dollars, would you take it? Well, first of all, you'd be like, you don't got a billion dollars, so you can't give it to me. You'd be skeptical of the whole premise. But let's say I did have a billion dollars and I offered it to you. Would you take it? Yes, you would take the billion dollars. That was an easy question. The second question's a little bit harder. What if taking the billion dollars meant that you could not wake up tomorrow? Now it just got harder. Why do I want a billion dollars if I... I'm not going to be around to enjoy it, right? So in other words, waking up in the morning is more valuable to you than a billion dollars. I think all of us value our lives. So what if somebody offered you eternal life? What if God offered to give you? Because he can give it, nobody else can. What if he offered to give you eternal life? Well, he did. God promises to give us eternal life. But here's the part we're not comfortable with, but not to prolong our human life. Becoming a Christian is not a guarantee of physical healing. God made you eternal He made you immortal. Now you are a superhero. And that adopting that superhero identity is going to mean leaving behind your old identity. God's inviting you to be Superman, yet you still want to be Clark Kent. I think one of the greatest scenes of any movie ever is when it's at the end of the movie and Iron Man is at the press conference. And what does he say? I am Iron Man. I'm like, yes, you are. I had gotten so tired of that dumb plot line in every Spider-Man movie. You got to hide your identity because they'll come after your family if they know that you're a superhero. So it's a stupid plot line. And it was in every single superhero movie until Robert Downey Jr. says, I am Iron Man. 
Like, yeah, leave the old behind. Forget it. Become who you were created to be. Okay, now we're, we got to leave Iron Man to let the analogy to continue go. Don't, don't hold on to the old. Don't continue to value the old. You're not that person anymore. You're somebody better. You're somebody new. Your hope is not in this physical body. Your hope is in the eternal life that God has given you. That's who you are now. It's your new identity. The psalmist says to God, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Yeah. Like, no. Enemies all around me can't touch me, can't shake me. I'm impervious. I'm immortal. I have eternal life. You cannot take it from me because it was given to me by God. Who's our enemy? The Satan is our enemy. Jesus tells us we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're fighting against rulers and authorities of the unseen world. And the Satan's attacking. But you're impervious. You're eternal. He can't touch you. Your life is now hidden in Christ, not in these bodies. He's attacking and we're feasting. He's attacking and we're celebrating because the victory is ours. The storm is all around us. But we're protected. What does an umbrella do? The, the, the rains fall, but the umbrella allows us, the, it doesn't stop the storm. The umbrella does not stop the storm. It does not stop the rain. But what the umbrella does is it allows us to stand in the rain with confidence that my white shirt is not going to become see-through. Right? An umbrella doesn't stop the rain. It allows us to stand in the rain. And that's what faith does. Faith in God does not stop all the pain. It doesn't stop all the attacks. It doesn't remove all the storms. Those things still happen. But faith in God gives us confidence, it gives us courage, and it gives us peace to stand in the storm, to stand in the pain, to stand when the attacks come. The apostle Paul said, when you believed, when you put God first, you were marked in him with a seal. In other words, you weren't just marked like Congratulations, now you have the label Christian. You've got the Christian word attached to your name, and now you're in the club. No, it's much more than that. It's much greater than that. The gift that we gave is not a change of label. It's a change of identity. It's a change of eternity. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You were marked with a seal. And you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit lives in you. You are not who you once were. You are now a temple of God. Before you believed, you were dead in your sin. You still identified with the world. You were still open to the enemy's attack. There was no faith umbrella for you. But then you put God first. Then you believed and you were sealed, Paul says. You were sealed. What's the purpose of a, of a seal? Well, in the Middle Ages, they didn't have, like, the envelopes with the glue already on it. So how did they seal their envelopes? They, they took a dot of wax, and then they would put the wax on the letter, and that wax would serve two purposes on the letter. The first purpose of the seal was identity. When you got a letter in the mail, you could look at the symbol or the letter that was stamped into the wax, and it would tell you who sent the letter, even before you opened it. 
So you would look at the stamp and you would say, okay, who sent me this letter? Do I like them or not? Them or not? If I like them, I'll open it and I care about what they say, right? It's, in today's world, it's like you get a letter in the mail from the car warranty company. What do you do with that letter? That's trash. That's a waste of paper. But if you get a letter with the seal of the President of the United States. Now, I don't know what you think about the President of the United States, but let's say, it's, let's say you value the President of the United States, and you get a letter from the President of the United States with his seal on the letter. Now this letter's got some value, right? N now I care what this letter says. Now, now I may even frame this letter. I may cherish this letter. I'll pass it on to my kids. Now this letter has value. If you are marked with the Holy Spirit's seal, then you have value. Then your identity comes from the one who sent the letter. Your identity comes from the Creator. The gospel changes who we are before it changes what we do. Can I say that again? The gospel changes who we are before it changes what we do. It gives us a new identity. It is a journey of becoming who you already are, who you were already created to be. Our worth does not come from what we do, does not come from our habits. It comes from the person who made us and who filled us with his spirit. In other words, identity comes before activity. We do what we do because of who we are. Why do I obey Christ? It's not because I'm trying to get him to love me. It is because my identity is now hidden in Christ. It is now who we are. It is who I am. So this is what I do. Because of who I am, this is what I do. This is why we protect our kids when they're young. I have set out to create for my sons a Christian bubble. And I know this idea has a bad name in our society and, and people don't like you doing this for your kids, but I believe that they were entrusted to me for a reason and I will protect them. But I will even go beyond just protecting my sons. While they are in this bubble, I have an agenda and it is to tell my sons who they are, to hand off to them an identity. This is your heritage. This is who you are. I'm not doing the Disney thing and saying, go discover yourself. Go find yourself. I don't want you to find yourself. I want to tell you who you are. Because I know who I am. Because my father told me who I am. So I can now tell you who, you who you are. If you wonder why young people in our society are having such an incredible identity crisis right now, it is because we've told them to discover who they are. And so I can never be satisfied with, with what I've been told. I can't be satisfied with what my parents were because I've been told over and over and over again to discover myself, to in, reinvent myself. And it's incredibly damaging and so as a result, our teenagers feel this need to change who they are and, and, to, and to start making things up and creating this new identity. That's because we have not told our children who they are in Christ. Where their value comes from. What their identity is. The second purpose of a seal is protection. Protection. If you got a letter from the President of the United States, yet the seal had been broken, what would you know? You would know you were under attack. You would know that you have an enemy, that somebody's spying on you. Because the letter is no longer sealed. I've got two cans here of some, I don't, I don't know what your opinion is, but I would say delicious contents. 
quite a fan of the contents of these cans. And on the outside, these two cans look identical. They were created by the same person or company. They were filled with the same substance. Yet there is a big difference between these two cans. One is sealed and one is not. Now, a sealed can has much more value than an unsealed can because the contents that were placed in the can are still there. This one is trash and this one is treasure, right? And then it goes beyond that because what happens when a seal is broken on a can? Not only are the contents lost, yet also the protection is lost. Because when this can is under attack by an enemy, it caves way. It, it, is, it is crushed under the attack of the enemy of my foot. It cannot stand against my weight. Yet the can that is sealed is not only filled, it is also protected, right? Because it is sealed, the contents inside of it make it stronger than it ever is without it. The contents inside of the can give it the strength that it could not have in and of itself. The can in and of itself has no strength. But if the can is sealed and filled, it is strong. Christians, when you are sealed and filled, filled, it's hard to say that. When you are sealed and filled, the strength that you have is not your own strength. It is the strength that is given to you by the spirit that fills you and by the God who protects you, the God who seals you. It is a gift that is given to you, child of God. The Holy Spirit's seal will give you a new identity and it will give you eternal protection. And here's the really good news. God's seal is not aluminum and it is not a piece of wax. God's seal is unbreakable. No one, no one can remove God's spirit from you. No enemy can defeat you. You are a child of God and no one can take from him your spirit. He's got you. He's with you. He will carry you. Before we end, I want to read a passage to you. And I'm sorry, this is much longer than a passage I would normally read. But the other day I read this. And it's one of those passages that if you ever read a passage a hundred times and then you go back and read it the hundred and once time and it just hits you in a whole new way. I was reading this passage a couple weeks ago and I just started sobbing in my office. Because as I was reading this passage, something overwhelmed me, and I realized that in this passage, Jesus is praying for me, and Jesus is praying for you, because I've always just seen this kind of as the word of Jesus. This, this is valuable, but when I realized that he was doing this for me, it meant something different to me, so that's my invitation to you. As I read this passage, realize it is literally Jesus praying for you. In fact, later in the passage, he'll even mention you. So this is Jesus' words, Jesus' prayer, that we get an insight to see how he prays to his heavenly Father. It's from John 17, starts in verse 13. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled, filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them, attacks them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world but to keep them safe from the evil one. 
They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I gave myself as a holy sacrifice for them, so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples that were there with him, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their messages. That's you. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love me as much or love them as much as you love me. Jesus just said, God the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. What did you do to earn that? How perfect are you? Because Jesus is. Apparently, God's love for us has nothing to do with our actions. Apparently, God's love for us has nothing to do with how much we have sinned. Verse 24. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Christians, this world is not our home. Your body in in this is not who you are. We can't just blend in as if we're just different humans with different ideas than the rest of them. We can't treat it as if this world is where our treasure is. The way God protects you is he gives you eternal life. He gives you peace in this world. He gives you an umbrella to stand in it. And he gives you a promise of eternity. So we put him first in everything because he is our identity. And as we put him first more and more, as he sanctifies us more and more, as he changes us, as he protects us and seals us, we are on a journey to heaven with him. God, today I pray that you would draw our attention to you. That you would daily fix our eyes on you. Remove distractions. Give us peace. For anybody here today who's struggling through pain, I pray that you would give them peace and hope that you would fill them with your joy and seal them with your spirit. God, all of our hope is in you. So we trust you alone in Jesus' name. Amen.